Well, I'm now seven months into the Bear Hawk build. At the end of the last video update, six months, I was just finishing up spray painting the fuselage. During the last month, I have taken quite a lot of time off, but I've also accomplished a lot. Let's go take a look at progress. So what I've done in a nutshell in the last month is I started by unmasking the aircraft. I then, I had all these parts that are pretty much finished, so I put them into my storage unit. Then what I did is I raised uh, the aircraft back onto its landing gear. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. One thing I wanted to do is make some progress with assembling the avionics racks, and I've done quite a lot of work on that. We've started on the instrument panel. Another thing that I've made good progress on is the doors here. We'll talk about that in a minute too. And uh, then, as of yesterday, I've uncrated the engine. Now in order to remove the wooden frame from the front of the aircraft and reinstall the firewall, I had to get the aircraft back up onto its own landing gear and wheels, um, as you can see here. That is not a particularly easy task to do. It, it took me a good couple of hours. I used the hoist that you can see um, holding the engine there. I used the hoist to actually lift the aircraft up and uh, I used a couple of tie downs on ratchets to pull the landing gear in uh, to the opposite side of the fuselage and that gave me the leverage that I needed um, in order to get the shock struts into place. The shock struts are designed to have probably another 150 to 200 kilograms of engine uh, weight, uh, engine and prop weight pulling down on the fuselage and that spreads the uh, undercarriage legs apart. The problem is when you don't have that weight in place they don't sit correctly at the correct angles and I had to use uh, the ratchet tie downs to pull them into place. Now that I've got them there, I've realized that I don't have the streamlined tubes on them. So this week, I'm gonna to have to just take the, uh, the shock struts back off, put the streamlined tubes on, in, into place. They're unpainted at the moment, so I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna go about this. I may just need to paint them first and bite the bullet on that. So a couple of weeks ago, I decided to start work on the avionics rack and I, uh, I ended up just using an angled aluminium piece. It's very lightweight, very strong. There's a number of ways that it could be done. You could use, uh, for instance, just uh, aluminium sheet or carbon fiber sheet would work probably equally as well. But I just decided to use angled aluminium. I got some very lightweight aluminium um, from a local supplier, cut it to length, drilled it and uh, bolted it with AN3 bolts and Adele clamps to the 4130 uh, steel tubing. It's worked very, very well. It's very solid. So here I've installed the Dynon avionics. I made uh, a rack, an avionics rack, out of three pieces of angled aluminium. You can see them there. It makes a nice simple rack. I've bolted them to the 4130 cross tubes and I've bolted the avionics modules to them. So here I've got the Dynon engine management system, the VHF radio, the transponder and the ADSB unit. Next I installed the Dynon advanced control module. That's bolted to one of the 4130 uh, steel cross tubes. And I've also used another piece of angled aluminium as a support bracket. If I zoom in here, you can see the avionics uh, mounted in behind on the racks there. And uh, that's, that's the Adaha sitting uh, front and centre. I've left a little bit of space on that rack either side and that's for the Dynon lithium battery. So here's a view of the mock-up instrument panel that my friend Jason made up for me. I went round to Jason's place one evening. We spent about an hour and a half with a CAD program and uh, we entered all the dimensions into it. It's quite amazing actually because for instance, uh, here's the cutout for the Dynon radio. It's even got the, uh, it's, it's even managed to laser cut the holes for the nut plates. I'm quite impressed. And I'm very, very pleased that we did this because as you can see here, this is where my event um, cutout is. But what we discovered once we actually fit it into place is that the event itself will strike the 4130 steel tubing behind that. So we're gonna have to raise it by 20 millimeters and I'm gonna go around to Jason's again this week and get that done. As a result, the holes that uh, were cut out for my cabin heat and also for the park brake are going to clash with the air vents. So we're going to move those over to here and they fit quite nicely in here. Most of the other um, cutouts for the screens and the radios all fit just like a glove and they're quite amazing actually. There's a couple that we got wrong, um, although I've, I've got the red mixture control in here just for a trial fit. That's actually going to be for the throttle. And that, the diameter of that cutout needs to be slightly smaller. For some reason, the throttle cutout is smaller than all the others. The starter button is going to go over here. That one, we managed to get about half a mil too small. So we're just going to widen that out. What I'm then going to do, we're going to do one more trial run um, and cut out uh, another mock-up panel just, just to ensure that the fit is correct. And, and then what I'm going to do is drop this into a place that can do a laser cutout on the actual aluminium panel. 
We're then going to make sure that it all fits properly, install the nut plates, and then we're going to get it powder coated. I dropped the aircraft seats into the upholster on Friday. He's going to go ahead and make up the foam squabs for the seats, and then I'm going to bring them back here and do a trial fit. I'm just going to sit in them for a while and make sure they're quite comfortable. We've made a few changes to the design of the foam pads, and that's to ensure that the eye line of a six foot uh, pilot or passenger sits below the door frame and that you can see under the wing. This was a discussion recently on the uh, Bear Hall Forum. So we've managed to achieve that and we've done it by keeping the uh, thickness of the foam at the back of the seat pad to about 40 millimeters. At the front of the pad, it's gonna raise up to 70 or 80 millimeters and give support under your thighs. That should work really well. The thickness of the uh, back support will still be around 40 millimeters and I've sourced a type of foam that's very dense but quite comfortable. So that should work really well. Now one thing I've really enjoyed doing in the last month is making up these Kydex panels. So I ordered the Kydex from the States. I've actually done a, a short separate video, very quick video on it. Um, but just in a nutshell, I ordered it from the States. It comes in flat sheets of different sizes. I decided to order it in black and it's heat moldable. It's the stuff that they use in commercial aircraft cabins. So you can see down here, this is actually two separate uh, Kydex panels. It's just sitting in place. It's going to have an aluminium uh, orange trim over the top. I've cut a, uh, a hole in it for the seat rail and it fits beautifully. It's, it's really, really good. I do have a couple of issues to resolve with it. Up here, I've made a Kydex panel for the wing route and I've, I've made one that goes in uh, behind, uh, in between both the wing routes there. That's actually just Velcroed into place. I do need to add another little pieces of velcro just to hold it it's so light i weighed all of the kydex panels i think there's nine of them in total and the weight total to five pounds now five pounds on its uh, on its own yeah for some people that's quite a, a, a weight increase but when you think about it it's not actually a five pound increase because you've got to cover it with something so you'd probably be covering it let's say with a lightweight fabric adhesive uh, primer paint so maybe the weight increase might be three pounds or two pounds it's not significant um, and all of it is very close to the center of gravity because I actually covered um, the interior uh, aft cabin just in lightweight fabric anyway. So that's, that's all covered and painted. So you can see from this angle, there, there's another piece of uh, Kydex in the forward footwell. That's actually not sitting in place properly there. It sits right up against the panel. The, the issue being that um, since I've installed the avionic rack with the Adele clamps wrapped around the tubing, I haven't yet trimmed the Kydex to fit and allow room for those uh, Adele clamps. But that works very, very well. There is a small issue to resolve as to how I terminate it up against the, the tubing on the, on the door sill there. If I did it again, so um, this one here is not in place, but the Kydex is going to curve around here. What I probably should have done is uh, used uh, screws, self-tapping screws and nut plates here to fix this piece of orange trim in place. And that way I could have just tucked the Kydex in the back. But I had already riveted it um, several weeks ago when, uh, before I started installing the Kydex. So I have to resolve. I've discovered that the Kydex bonds very, very well with a PVC adhesive. So I'll probably make up some uh, short Kydex strips and just uh, use the adhesive to, to bond them in place and then tuck it in behind that piece of orange trim to resolve. I've done a lot of work in the last month on the aircraft doors. This was a modification. Quite clearly, anytime you do a modification, it results in a lot of extra work. This is no different. So I've put these in uh, previous videos. But what I've been doing in the last month is making up these interior panels for the doors out of Kydex. Look, this one's turned out pretty well, but this is the third iteration of, the, of this panel. So you can see what I've done here. I've, I've gone around and drilled holes all the way around the door frame, and I'm using nut certs. Now, I ran into a problem two days ago. I, I broke the mandrel for the nut cert tool, the riveting tool. So I haven't been able to finish it off, but you'll get the idea. There's the panel there, and that sits quite nicely over the interior of the door and then you can see there that's the door handle so I've got to make up one small piece of kydex which is actually going to be bonded onto the door itself but the rest of it is going to be removable I'm holding it in place with small black machine screws into the nut sets and I think that's going to work really well here's my EarthX lithium battery now I've been looking at a number of different mounting options where it's sitting at the moment is under the right hand passenger seat certainly another place that it could go was on the cabin side of the firewall and behind the dash. I've got a, a ton of spare room up there. However, I think where it's actually going to end up 
is on the engine side of the firewall. There are a number of issues. It's a compromise wherever you put it. On the engine side of the firewall, the issue there is the heat that's generated from the engine. And these lithium batteries don't do well in heat. So probably what I'm going to do is put a breather tube, an air breather tube aimed at it just to keep the, the temperature down. I've also got a stainless steel case that you can see it's, it's sitting in the case at the moment and that's insulated. So it's got a temperature rating on it of 65 degrees Celsius. And as long as I keep it below that, I think it'll survive quite well. Putting the EarthX battery up on the firewall does have a number of advantages. However, it does mean you've got significantly shorter cable runs and that equates to better power to the starter motor. So yesterday I, I uncrated the aircraft engine, which is an IO540. It's a Bob special, um, reconditioned by Bob Barrows in the States and shipped over here with the, uh, in the container with the, the rest of the Bearhawk kit set. So here it is. Um, beautiful looking engine. I my, I know very little about these uh, aircraft engines other than sitting behind them for several thousand hours and operating them. Wish I'd known a whole lot more then. So the first thing I've got to do is learn everything about the engine before I install it. And uh, with that in mind, what I'm doing is I've printed off a, uh, a layout of the accessory casing here and I'm labeling everything on the engine just so that I can get used to where everything sits. I've also got the engine uh, mount here on the workbench. Um, I'm contemplating and talking to a few friends about how to go about this. So one option is to just lift the engine up as it is and uh, do a test um, test run, dry mounting it on the on the firewall. Uh, what I, another idea I, that I'm considering is actually making a perspex firewall, fitting the engine and uh, then drawing everything out. So the idea here is that I don't want to drill any holes and then find out that I've put them in the wrong place. So I've gone ahead and labeled my accessory casing. And that's in order so that I can learn what everything is and where everything goes. What I've learned so far is I've got the oil cooler. Um, this is to the oil cooler. This is the return line from the oil cooler. I've got a breather here. This is where the tachometer attaches to. This is a vacuum blank. I've got the oil pressure line will go in here. This is a hydraulic blank here. And down here is the fuel pump with the in and out lines. So one thing I noticed with this engine, it's probably an older crankcase, it's got the dipstick mounted fairly high up and close to the centre line of the engine. What that means is the dipstick's not going to be under the cowling doors that open, it's actually going to be under the fixed flat centre part of the engine cowling. So I won't be able to remove it unless I install a special door just for the dipstick. So you can see here on the accessory casing, um, this is what I think is a rock catcher type oil filter. So it's a very, um, it's an older type. It's got a coarse uh, mesh screen in it. And my understanding, which is quite limited at the moment, is that there's nothing wrong with using that. And I do believe you can do uh, quite high hours in between overhauls on the engine. A friend of mine, Bob, told me that uh, a fleet of aircraft he used to service had the rock catcher type filters on them and they were doing well in excess of 3,000 hours and up to 4,000 hours in between overhauls. So it was quite amazing actually. So nothing wrong with using that per se, but my understanding is you have to do an oil change every 25 hours. So that may be a limiting factor. I think what a lot of guys do is take that off. They uh, put an oil uh, adapter on there and run lines and install the oil filter on the firewall. That's most likely what I'll do. So these Perspex blanks are where the magnetos would normally go. And in my case, I've ordered EMAG ignition systems. So there's two of them left and right, and, and they uh, essentially just fit straight in where the magnetos come out. I received them a couple of months ago, so let's go take a look at them. So this is what an EMAG looks like. It's quite a heavy little unit. It's got its own built-in alternator that's driven from the rotary drive here on the underside. And on the top side, it has, uh, this is a six cylinder one, so it has the outlet for the six spark plug leads. Now, like all modern uh, electronic ignitions, on aircraft, they have two power sources. You have the primary power source that keeps uh, the, the mag running all the time. But if that fails, you need a backup power source. Most aircraft use a second uh, battery, a backup battery. What EMAG have done is quite interesting. They simply built in a small alternator. That's the rotary uh, inbuilt alternator. It's running all the time. In the event of a failure of your primary power source, it simply reverts automatically to the built-in alternator. Now, the kit set comes with everything that's required for installation. It looks to me to be a very complete uh, kit set and uh, there's going to be a fair amount of research and reading before I get to that point where I can install it. There's a number of accessories to mount onto the engine, so I'm planning to mount these perhaps in the next week or so temporarily just to get an idea of where everything fits and how it fits. The items that I've got here 
uh, the two cabin air heat boxes. Got the oil cooler and the oil cooler mounting here. Also the alternator to go on the uh, engine itself and the prop governor to go on the front of the engine. Well over the next three or four weeks I'd like to make good progress with finishing the interior of the aircraft and that's going to entail largely finishing the Kydex panelling off and, and the panelling on the doors. I hope to have the seats back and finished from the upholster ready to be installed. Just behind the firewall I'd like to have made good progress with the avionics and particularly with the wiring. There is some miscellaneous wiring to be done for fuel pump and lights and that kind of thing. I'd like to have the stick grips installed and also to have made and installed the instrument panel. Forward of the firewall, my plan is to get underway with the engine installation. I think there's quite a lot of work there. I'm thinking four to six weeks and uh, all going well, I'll have the engine mounted and uh, some of the ancillary devices uh, just forward of the firewall installed. So that's seven months of progress into my Bear Hawk build. I'm still thoroughly enjoying it. Thanks very much for watching. I'll do another update in a month's time.